Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to QPS Talk Time live from Tipperary University Hospital. Uh, we're delighted here to have a very large panel with four wonderful projects to share with you, and there'll be plenty of time for questions later on as the session progresses. So I'm going to start and I'm going to introduce Maria Barry, who's the general manager here in the hospital and who leads the, the service here within Tipperary University Hospital. And she's going to tell us a little bit about the service. Thank you, Maria. Good afternoon, uh, Juanita, and thank you very much. I'm delighted to welcome everyone to South to Tipperary University Hospital. And I suppose just to say who we are and what we are, Tipperary University Hospital. We strive to enhance the health and well-being of the people we serve by providing excellent patient-centered care, delivered by skilled uh, staff and caring staff. We have in Tipperary University Hospital creating an environment that fosters a culture of quality improvement through patient being patient focused and using all opportunities as learning opportunities. And this allows the staff to improve practice, ensures that care is of standard <coughs> and that the experience of our patients is enhanced. Who are we? Tipperary University Hospital is located in the town of Clonmel. It's a model three hospital. It's part of the South Southwest Hospital Group, one of 10 hospitals. The hospital has 210 inpatient beds and 22 day beds, and we provide acute hospital care. To the geographical area of Tipperary and the whole of the county of Tipperary, West Waterford, North Cork, and we do have patients coming from Kilkenny and Limerick as well. We have our patient pathways are predominantly with the model fours that are in the South Southwest Hospital Group, predominantly UHW and CUH. We also have shared care in the pediatric and maternity services, and our maternity services are delivered in association with the um, Ireland South Women and Infants Directorate. This is part of the clinical network of the South Southwest Hospital Group, which the four mater maternity uh, units of the South Southwest are part of. We provide shared care from a paediatric perspective as well, and we work closely with the Children's Hospital Ireland. Our mental health services then are, are we work with St. Luke's in Kilkenny and Ennis um, Hospital, and that, that is the, the NUL. TIP uh, UH is the, an academic, has academic links with UCC. Uh, which is predominantly our, our primary academic partner. We also have students, medical students coming from UL and midwifery students coming from UL. We take UCD students and a lot, our nursing students then come from Southeast Technological University. We also take um, HSCPs from UCD and, and other, other colleges as required. Our activity, we've seen a huge increase in our activity in the last number of years. And our total ED presentations in 2022 was in excess of 44,000. That's a, an increase of almost 11.5% in the previous year of 2021. 20, we operated last year as 101% occupancy, so that does bring its challenges, particularly with ED overcrowding. However, our average length of stay is only 5.5, so we, we, we do work um, well and we have a lot of good patient flow processes in place. We believe in Tipperary University Hospital that staff are our greatest resource, and we currently employ in excess of 1,100 WTEs, 35 of whom are consultants. That staffing has increased over 30% since 2017. So I think, you know, you will see today as we present our various <laughs> QI projects, how important our staff are in ensuring that we, we deliver patient safety service. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thanks very much, Maria. Um, and I'm actually from Clonmel, so as somebody that's used the service, I can add strongly for the, the positivity of being through that ED department, and, um, and, and it is a phenomenal service. I'm going to pass over now to Maura Gogan, who is the quality manager within Tipperary University Hospital. And she's going to co-host the session today. Um, so Maura's going to tell us just first a little bit about her role and also a little bit about the focus on quality within the service. Thanks, Maura. Hello, all. Welcome all to Tipperary University Hospital. Let's talk a little bit about Tipperary University Hospital. It's situated within the beautiful Golden Vale in the valley of Shlevenamon. And nearby, we have the Blue Way and lovely mountain walks for all ages and levels, and the River Shore flowing gracefully close by. And also flowing in Tipperary University Hospital are our many quality improvements that have been initiated by our frontline staff. All stakeholders are essential for improving the quality of care delivered. In my role as the quality manager, I place emphasis on teamwork and engagement with all stakeholders to promote the delivery of care, effective and evidence-based, ensuring that it must be safe. 
tomorrow we are hosting our annual quality day here. This year's theme is patient safety together at Tipperary University Hospital. So we'll have 20 presentations involving over 30 staff, 36 posters involving over 50 staff from all departments and disciplines with the additional support for our patient representative service users group and our inclusion working group. So our quality day, what does it do and why do we run it? Our quality day instigates and gives visibility to the quality projects ongoing throughout the disciplines and departments within the hospital. It's the teamwork here that underpins the success of the initiatives. The quality day helps with building and developing our learning culture here. And this reflects on improvement in practice, the patient experience and patient safety. I suppose, Juanita, to be honest, what's great about it is that it shows the overall effort that's carried out collectively within the hospital. And that brings ownership and satisfaction for us all. So together, we've built up a trust in each other, in our teams, and this facilitates our staff to be proactive, willing, and empowered to suggest a change. Look, we have family members and friends that walk through the doors of our hospital, and we need to deliver the safest of care that we would want for ourselves and our loved ones. So today, we'll just present four samples of QIs ongoing here in Tipperary University Hospital. Shannon will present her pink magnet, and this demonstrates the effectiveness of the visual and the significance of situational awareness when the early warning score is escalating and a visual awareness of that deteriorating patient. The critical care skills team will demonstrate the importance of psychological safety within the learning environment to promote effectiveness and efficiency of the healthcare worker skills in the emergency situations. And this ensures competence and confidence of the staff. Heather then will demonstrate how the team in paediatrics have improved their speed and accuracy in drug calculations to ensure medication safety during a paediatric emergency. And then Audrey, Elaine and Samira will reveal their progress in the project to eliminate hospital acquired clostridial difficile infections. So Shannon, if you're ready, we'll start with your presentation on the pink safety magnet. And Shannon is our clinical skills facilitator for the medical and surgical wards here in Tipperary University Hospital. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, Maura. Um, so as Maura said, my name is Shannon and I'm going to talk about the pink safety magnet, which is a QI project I developed um, just to raise situational awareness within the hospital. Um, so firstly, I suppose, what is the safety magnet? So the safety magnet is placed beside patient names on a whiteboard so staff can see instantly which patients other staff are concerned about or patients who have deteriorated. So the reason it's bright pink is to make sure that it's easily visible on patient whiteboards so that staff can see instantly the patients of concern on the ward because sometimes there can be a lot of magnets on the board. It's designed to create situational awareness for everyone in the clinical area and it reminds staff to use the pink is bar deteriorating patient stickers that we have in tip UH to escalate the patient. Um, so I suppose, where did the safety magnet come from? So initially, a CNM raised a query about having a document for safety huddles to be able to have a record of patients of concern. So I had previously attended the RCPI SAFE programme and I adapted a safety huddle sheet for the ward to use for nursing huddles. But once the ward started using it, they found that it was just extra paperwork and they felt like it took a bit more time to fill out. So I went back and I reviewed the clinical guidelines, number one and 11, and how I could introduce something that would identify patients of concern quickly without the need for paperwork. I looked at our local iNews policy and our ISBAR stickers, and that's when I decided to introduce the pink magnet to place beside patient names. I then developed a guideline for the staff about pink safety magnet, which was reviewed by the nurse practice development ADON and three CDM2s for approval. I then disseminated the guideline to all the staff and uploaded it to QPulse and I educated staff on the wards about the safe pink safety magnet and its use. So I suppose just a bit about what situation awareness is. So it's the ability to anticipate and act on needs based on surrounding events. So by creating situation awareness, we can reduce avoidable error and harm. It improves communication among MDT members. It improves the working culture and it ensures provision of high quality and consistent care. And um, so feedback then as to how the safety magnet is working. So at the moment, I have asked ADAN, CNM3, CNM2s and CNM1s for their opinion. I'm hoping in the future, in the next couple of months, to get the opinions of staff nurses and HCAs as well, because they are just as involved. 
So the feedback initially is that students are always keen to learn what the safety magnet means and why on the whiteboard and why it's being used. Another CNM fed back and said they think they're great as they highlight to everyone on duty who the sickest patients are throughout everyone's shift. It alerts them to patients they were unaware were unwell, particularly with the agents in the night duty shift. Beneficial to nurses and other sections to be aware of unwell or at-risk patients. And it's also a prompt for, again, agents going around the evening time on rounds to ask about the condition of that patient when they see the magnet. And I suppose what's next for the safety magnet? So we're planning to continue monthly quality care metrics, which audits patient monitoring and surveillance and the use of the ISBAR to document escalation of patient care. And in conjunction with that, we're going to do our continued biannual iNews clinical guideline number one audit, which evaluates the iNews escalation response protocol and the modified escalation response protocol. So the reason for that is that in November 22, when we did our iNews audit, we were excellent and we scored 100%. But when it was actually broken down for 2022 in our quality care metrics, the ISBAR tool was only used 32% of the time to escalate a deteriorating patient. Um, so we're planning to then audit safety huddle paperwork because since we have introduced the magnet, we've also managed to introduce the safety huddle paperwork. And I plan to look at the paperwork and the whiteboards on the ward to identify if patients discussed during safety huddles have had a pink magnet placed beside their name. I plan on doing continued safety huddles and regular reminders to staff to update the whiteboards and pink safety magnets. We are one of the pilot hospitals for the digitalization of iNews and Tip UH, so hopefully when that's implemented, it'll be great. Um, continued staff education around the safety magnet and implementation of education around the safety magnet into structured study days. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Shannon. Shannon, can I just ask you there now, just one question. How do you know that that safety magnet is actually working? So between the feedback, so I have very good feedback from staff, but I've also looked at the quality care metrics. So as I said, it's relatively new. We've only implemented on all the wards since January of this year. So what I did was I took the quality care metrics from last year between February and April and from this year between February and April. And there's actually an increase in our use of the ISBAR tool, as well as documenting our frequency and escalation of the patients. And as well, they have implemented patient safety walk rounds and the feedback from that is very good that staff find it very useful to identify patients who are at risk of deterioration. Thanks very much, Shannon. Thank you for that. And now we'll move then to our next presentation, which is critical care skills. And our panelists for this, there's Dr. Andre Engelbrecht, who's a consultant in emergency medicine. We have Sarah Jane Wasenbach, who's a member of our nurse practice development team and the clinical skills facilitator in the emergency department and AMAU. We have Eilish Mansfield, who's our clinical skills facilitator, and she's covering the critical care areas, ICU and CCU. And we have Dr. Marcella Lanzinger, and she's our consultant anesthesiologist, and she's also the clinical director for the critical care medicine team. So, Eilish, would you like to start? I will. Thank you, Maura. So, good afternoon, everyone. So, welcome to our critical care skills day here in Tipperary University Hospital. Um, this program, training program, we developed earlier this year and ran our first training day in February. The plan going forward is they will happen quarterly. So Maura has already introduced our team. So just to expand on that a little bit further, in our roles as clinical skills facilitators, we've been largely involved in the design and development and implementation of this training day. However, this training day wouldn't be possible without the support of our medical colleagues. So thanks to Dr. Andre and Dr. Lansinger, who are also hugely involved in teaching on the training day. And also just to acknowledge other senior members of nursing staff as well, who are also involved. Okay, so it's very much a, a multidisciplinary team approach. So just to give a background really, and look at the reasons why we developed this training program. So there was three main factors. So firstly, there was no pre-existing critical skills simulation training day in Tipperary University Hospital in our roles as clinical skills facilitators in the clinical environments, working alongside the nurses on the floor, on the ground. We observed that nurses lacked confidence in performance of certain um, critical care skills. And also there was verbal feedback from <coughs> nurses on suggestions on topics on areas that they would like to learn more about and develop their knowledge further on. We also circulated suggestion lists in each and each of the um, areas in both the emergency department and critical care and nurses. Um, they were displayed and there's a list of topics and suggestions of what nurses would like to include on the training day. All these factors were underpinned by reflective concepts of reflective practice. Nurses reflecting on their own uh, performance so in terms of professional development. 
now it's working together as a team, as a multidisciplinary team, and reflecting on how best to deliver this um, training day. So just to give you an overview, really, and look at the five key components relevant to the benefits of this training day. So number one being patient safety. So we're very much looking at interprofessional learning in a calm, controlled environment away from the clinical care area where interprofessions, you know, they can ask questions. There's peer participation, there's group learning, um, there's learning by doing, they can make mistakes, um, there's observation by facilitators, and this is all to ensure that there's safe um, care being delivered to patients. Um, another factor too that our training program considers is building relationships, and that's in terms of interdisciplinary, so between medical and nursing colleagues, and also interdepartmental. So, and that also helps with communication to um, as well with regards to transition of patient care and clinical handovers. Um, our training day also ensures that we are delivering high quality care. So a lot of our teaching is very much based as well and underpinned by local, national and international um, guidelines as well. And that's all to ensure that safe care is being delivered. We also look at increased confidence and competence. Um, so what's taught in the classroom is filtered to and brought into the clinical areas. And we're basically bridging, we're hoping to bridge the gap between the theory and the knowledge, enhancing theory and further developing um, interprofessional um, practical skills. So those collaborative work practices, and that's ensuring that there's consistency of patient care as well. So we've adopted the uh, principle of constructive alignment in designing our training simulation program, where we aligned the learning outcomes with the teaching learning activities and the assessment methods. So I'll now hand you over to my colleague, Sarah, who will discuss these in more depth. Thank you very much, Ailish. Good afternoon, everybody. So our learning outcomes that we identified from the study, were they were for participants to recognize early the deterioration patient, to define theory that's evolved in the use of a ventilator, demonstrate an understanding and management of knowledge and skill in coming from critical ill patient from a traumatic brain injury and also recognizing basic cardiac rhythms and managing a cardiac patient. To achieve these learning outcomes, um, on the skills day, what we did is we held theory sessions in the morning, which lasted 30 to 40 minutes, which were facilitated by our colleagues and by ourselves, which lasted about 30 to 40 minutes each. In the afternoon, then we moved on to the practical sessions where we split our participants into four groups. We mixed our participants, so every group had um, a member from the, from the CCU team, a member from the ICU team, and a member from the ET team. And each group then attended four practical facilitations where two facilitators simulated patient scenarios. These scenarios included um, a patient um, in respiratory failure that was in the intensive care unit. We had a patient in the CCU unit that um, had a myocardial infarction, and we um, simulated the management of this patient. Then we moved on to the traumatic brain injury patient in the ED from presentation onto management. And um, then we had a ward based patient that um, developed a gastrointestinal bleed, and where a hemovigilance officer helped us to then demonstrate um, um, and we implemented the massive perfusion protocol. Um, we assess the participants by asking them to complete um, a 30 question multiple choice questionnaire and by observing them um, during the practical skills uh, stations and carrying them out, asking them to carry out assigned tasks so we could assess that what they've learned on the day. Um, they went away with that knowledge and they could then implement it in practice. Feedback, as you can see, was very positive from both participants and our facilitators. Everybody thoroughly enjoyed the day. Staff had much more confident to handle critically ill patients after attending the day, and they felt that they learned a lot of new things, even our senior staff that came from the day. Because of the multidisciplinary approach and learning from other areas, they felt that they learned a lot, a lot of things. Um, if you have any questions about our day, please feel contact to, free to contact any of us. Thanks very much for listening. Lovely. Thanks very much, Sarah. Thanks, Anish. I suppose a question, Andrew, do you mind if I ask you, how does simulation training improve clinical performance? So the benefit of simulation in training has been well documented. And I think it always allows us to test procedures and systems to see whether there are any difficulties in those. But I think specifically in our setting, um, the ability for us to improve uh, prompt, um, transfer of care of patients, especially between the acute services and the emergency department and the ICU, that it has um, not only shown the different uh, aspects of the care of patients, but we can safely now and um, hand over the patient's care to our colleagues in those areas. And I think it creates a sense of muscle memory in the individual. 
when you're faced with a challenging or daunting clinical situation, you can um, kind of fall back on the fact, oh, I've done this before in my simulation training, and it takes a bit of the cognitive offloading off, and it makes the situation less daunting because you've done this before, you have been through it, and it makes the clinical situation less uh, intimidating. I'm getting a nudge here about time, so definitely, Marcel, if you're okay, we might just wait and ask you a question afterwards, and we'll move on then next to Heather. So Heather Powers, our clinical skills facilitator for pediatrics, and she's going to tell us about medication safety during a pediatric emergency. So Heather, if you're ready. Thank you, Maura. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Maura said, my name is Heather Power, and I'm clinical skills facilitator in the pediatric department in Tipperary University Hospital. What I uh, used as my quality initiative um, was me emergency medication um, management. Uh, we identified a problem um, in the children's ward um, several years ago um, where we would come across um, a small amount of children who required stabilisation and intub intubation for transfer, um, and we had to do complex drug calculations. Um, when you don't do these complex drug calculations in your daily practice, it can lead to high levels of anxiety and stress in an already stressful situation. The medications are all weight-based and can require complex calculations. Um, and last year, we transferred and intubated um, 11 children in one calendar year. So my aim is to provide the staff with the knowledge and confidence to prepare emergency medication. Um, I felt this we could improve the situation through education and skills development. I collaborated with my colleagues, the medical team, my uh, nursing colleagues, the pharmacy, um, and uh, to develop a tool that would assist everyone. So how did we develop the solution? So we had identified the problem um, about complex drug calculations, and I set about devising a standard tool to assist these drug calculations and preparations. After several prototypes, prototypes we were finally happy. A senior pharmacist reviewed the documents for content and accuracy, and we set about educational and practical sessions for the nurses and the doctors. This resulted in the staff who were competent and confident in their ability to prepare emergency drugs in a safe, accurate and efficient method. So what did we do? So for each emergency medication, um, the list is there on the left hand side. We developed a single laminated standardised sheet, which was prepared, uh, developed in collaboration with the paediatric team and pharmacy. We used the commonly used medications and we used the Children's Hospital Ireland critical care drug guidelines and the paediatric formerly from CHI also. The drug preparation sheets were then presented to the Tipperary University Hospital's drug and therapeutic group for validation. And then we started to use them in the ward. Before we started to use them, we had to provide education. So the education was provided at our annual mandatory study days. Um, I got anonymous feedback from the study days that demonstrated that st the staff found the tool useful and practical. Um, but as I said previously, we don't do these calculations in our daily practice. So in order to ensure that the staff remained confident and confident, I do regular unannounced medication calculation sessions in the ward. These sessions are short but effective, and they're a safe space where we can support each other and do a selection of weight-based emergency calculations. We've also had positive feedback from the Irish Paediatric Acute Transport Service to the ward manager on our management of medication. So the outcome of this initiative. So we have enhanced patient safety as the staff are less stressed and more confident and efficient with their complex medication preparations. And the medications are prepared in line with the CHI critical care medication. Therefore, there's less efficiency. Uh, sorry, there is more efficiency when transferring patients. We now uh, all, uh, use the same equipment and medication concentrations as CHI, IPATS, and the neonatal transport team, which not only provides a seamless transfer, but also enhances the care the children receive. We're much more confident in our ISBAR communication with the IPATS and neonatal transport team. And the care is standardised, so the ch our children here receive the same high quality care in Clamel as they would in larger children's hospitals in Ireland. Thank you. Thanks very much, Heather, for that. Heather, another question there. How did your paediatric team respond when you randomly were coming up to them and asking them to do drug calculations? I thought, uh, well, Maura, the first time I went in and suggested you could imagine uh, their faces, they weren't very impressed. But um, once we got into it and it, they realised it was short, 
short, short sessions that were done in a very supportive space and that they actually provided them uh, with reassurance that they were able to do these drug calculations. Um, it just gave them more confidence and more confidence and it reduced the stress levels when we knew a sick child was coming in that we were able to do these. Well done. Lovely. Thanks very much, Heather. So Thank now, you. cheers. Now we'll go to our fourth presentation, and that is the elimination of hospital acquired clostridios difficile for us here in Tipperary Hospital. And our panelists for this, we have Audrey O'Reilly, who's our chief pharmacist here in Tipperary University Hospital, we have Dr. Samir Bashir, who's a paediatric registrar, and we have Elaine Egan. And Elaine is the patient safety strategy coordinator with the South West Hospital Group and based in Tip UH. Elaine was one of our own. So, would you, Elaine, I think I believe you're starting. Would you like to start, please? Yes, thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. We are delighted to be here today to tell you about our project. The aim is the elimination of hospital acquired clostridioides difficile, and our focus is on medical patients. We would like to acknowledge the support that we've received from hospital management and from our multiple stakeholders here in Clonmel. We know globally there has been an increase in severity and the frequency of C. diff, and this has made it one of the most common healthcare associated infections. From enhanced surveillance carried out by infection control, outruled cross transmission here in our cases last year. So our main focus is on antimicrobial stewardship. And in particular, we are looking at um, the high risk antibiotics there, the four C's. To quote Denning, he said, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. This slide displays a run chart and as you can see, we have the number of cases of hospital acquired C. diff in TIP UH from quarter four in 2021 to quarter four in 2022. And as you can see, we had an increase in the number of cases during the summer months. So this made us curious and we wanted to see if we could dig a little deeper and see if we could make improvements here. So to begin with, we want to identify the area of the main concern. For this reason, we just did the baseline audit. And in this audit, we just review the medical notes of uh, the patient who are having the hospital required C. diff from June 23 to December 23. And the three main area which we identify were that the duration of the antibiotics for more than seven days. And in most of the patient's uh, medical notes, the plan for the review of antibiotic was not mentioned. And uh, moreover, the sleep uh, diagnosis was not mentioned in the discharge letter. So our aim was to improve the situation while living within the same resources. And for that one, we make the small changes, do the multiple PDSA to see that these changes are making an improvement or no. For this one, after the baseline audit, we just engaged a very enthusiastic geriatric medical consultant who was eager to work with us to eliminate the CD from the hospital. And the small changes we did were like, uh, first we appoint the clinical pharmacist in the ward round, and also we did some education session with the NCHDs. As we predict that these will have some positive impact, so it was resulted in decrease in the number of cases as well as there was the improvement in the prescription as well as in the documentation in the medical notes. And still this our uh, project is ongoing. And for that one, we are making sure that the changes which are causing the improvement, they are sustained. And they, at the same time, we are trying to spread the message. And uh, recently we have just moved to the new team to just to make sure that we can achieve our goal to eliminate the CD from the hospital. Um, so we have our ongoing process measures that I were trying to improve. So the um, documentation of indication review and duration, and we're doing this through numerous PDSA cycles. Um, and we also are continuously monitoring our outcome measures and our principal outcome measure being um, hospital, numbers of hospital acquired C. diff infection. The T-chart was chosen uh, for us to monitor our numbers of C. diff infection as they are a rare event and this will be an appropriate statistical tool for rare, for rare events. So on the T-chart, um, you can see the continuous blue line represents the number of days between newly detected cases of C. diff. And what we want to see is this blue line going upwards as that would uh, indicate 
less cases of C. diff. The segregated blue line, the dotted blue line, is the trend line. And you can see that the trend line, um, there's been an improvement in the upward trend, and it continues to trend upward. And this is despite two new cases of C. diff in medical patients at the end of April. We'd like to thank John Quinn for his support with this, John from the RCPI. And encouragingly, John advises us that our t-tests are showing we are moving towards significance with the changes we are implementing. But our project is not just about accumulating data. What will really determine the success or otherwise of our project is our ability as a QI team to engage with the staff here in TPV and to also engage with our patients and with these um, multidisciplinary groups to co-produce changes that will stick and last and that we can spread effectively throughout the hospital. And for us to be able to do that, we really need good governance here in the hospital. And that is what we have. As the QI team, we regularly report to the senior management of the hospital through the hospital's CDF action group. And this group are continually pushing us to deliver on this project, which we aim to keep the patient at the centre of. Thank you. Thanks very much, Liz. Um, again, can I just ask you about patient engagement? Like, have you involved any patients? Like, not only is C. diff an issue in hospitals, it's also a huge issue in the community. And I suppose if we are to eliminate um, C. diff, really we're going to need engagement from everybody. So have you considered engaging any of our patients? Uh, yes, Maura, we have. We've engaged with our um, patient representative service users group. And we've also engaged with a shared care patient in paediatrics. It's important that we can uh, empower and engage patients so that we can hear their stories and walk in their shoes so that we can continually uh, learn and improve um, going forward with this project. Lovely, thanks very much. Monita. Great. So just to say thanks very much to our, our panelists. I think that there's been a huge amount of um, information shared there. And thanks to people that have sent us messages quietly on the chat box while we've been waiting. Um, we just, we, we're going to ask just a, the, the panel a few questions that are coming in. Um, and if you have anything there that you'd like to ask them, feel free to pop it into the chat. We might start off with um, Dr. Marcella, Marcella Lanzinger, if you don't mind. And you were involved in the simulation project. Obviously, you know, it's a significant piece of work within the service. Could you maybe tell us what was the standout piece or the most outstanding piece for you in that work? Right. Um, that's a good question. So we've just completed a course last week again, and I have to say it's just a really fabulous setup because we've got the space for it, we've got the staff, and we have a fair amount of attendees. And what's really impressive, I think, is that we have a multidisciplinary setup of attendees. We have ED staff, we have um, CCU staff, we have ICU staff, and then we have myself as an anaesthetist, we have CNMs from ICU, we have hemovigilance, we have people come from the nursing admin office, and we've kind of added in medical students in their final years. And for example, with the respiratory scenario, now we have a patient who develops respiratory distress down in ED, he's then transitioned over to CCU, escalated to ICU. And that kind of just reflects a real life patient's journey through our system, how they're taking care, how they transition from one department to the next. And everybody kind of sees what the other departments are doing, what their concerns are, and how they can kind of ease the way from one part of the patient's care to the next part. And I think that's the real life experience that really enhances that course. And how important do you think that? following the patient's journey and into building relationships between the teams as they transition from one area to the next? Well, as uh, Andrew said earlier, it's um, a simulation scenario, but you actually get to real life hands on do things in practice and you get to actually interact with people that oftentimes you'd only know over the phone or you'd be kind of like, why are you not taking the patient yet? Or <laughs> where are we? Um, and then you understand what the concerns are in the other departments. I think it really helps to see how that patient flows through in their care um, from different departments. Okay. I think that, that's really helpful. Um, I think one of the things that struck me about this particular project was about the, the psychological safety and the yeah. trust. And obviously the challenge when you start a piece of work like this about very experienced people asking simple mm. questions. How did you maybe, and maybe Dr. Andrew might come to you on this, how did you build that sense of safety, that learning culture within the system to allow that to happen? 
I think um, we acknowledge from the start that we come into it not only as teachers, but we are there to learn from our colleagues that we work with. And it's, I think there's an element of vulnerability when you share your own experiences and sometimes your own mistakes um, that opens up uh, an opportunity for the participants to share some of their uh, perhaps, um, you know, least successful moments. And from there we build and we learn. And I think um, everybody's um, able and, and free to ask questions, to share their experiences, and we share back. And I think that builds that relationship of trust. And we bring it from an outside environment back into the hospital. And the next time that we work together, you know, we have that, that um, kind of level established already. Yeah, yeah. So it's not just in the day, it's that sort of ongoing. Exactly, yeah. Okay, that's, that's really good. I just see this, this, there's a lot of feedback coming in in terms of the positivity of the initiatives and, and a few people have commented on the fact that they're, they're, some of them are quite simple. They're, it's not rocket science, it's, you know, it, 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 it's very, very simple things that are making a, a difference. Um, and Gronje is just, you know, do you include a piece of medication? This is one for you, Heather. Do you include a piece on the medication cards for the sick kids coming in by ambulance? Who may have been treated by paramedics or advanced paramedics with certain pre hospital doses, as they may differ to the amounts given in the hospital. So I might pass it over to you, Heather. Yep, no problem. Um, no, the, the preparation sheets are specifically for our use, but when the, uh, when the paramedics bring in um, a sick child to us, we do an ISBAR handover with them and we would document what that child has been given prior to coming to the hospital. So it wouldn't be uh, used for ambulance services. They just get the information from them when the child comes into us. So okay. that, that that's really helpful to know. And and the other thing, maybe just Heather, this one is for yourself as well. You know, obviously one of the big things about this is the multidisciplinary team. You know, and and people often talk about okay, well, oh, what's important? Multidisciplinary teamwork is really important. But if I was to say to you, how did you make that happen? How did you encourage multidisciplinary teamwork in this piece of work? What would you say? I I'd have to say um, the. The doctors are keen, like they're involved in it as well. They're doing the prescribing of these medications. So um, they do get involved. Dr. Samira, who's on one of the other presentations there, she she herself and our colleagues, when we're doing the medication management, the, the short ones on the ward, they do get involved with us and they do ask to take the drug sheets and they'll practice them themselves. So everybody, I suppose, wants to be able to do it for their own um best practice really and also to be confident of looking after the children when they come in. Great. Thank you for that. Thanks for that. Um and maybe we might just go back to um Elaine, Audrey and um Samira if you don't mind. One of the things that I noticed when we did our preparation piece for this was the the amount of measurement, you know, tools that you'd used. And obviously you're involved and you're doing the, the RCPI diploma at the moment um, that's funded by the National Quality and Patient Safety Directorate. But I suppose one of the questions I suppose that was in my mind was if I was doing this piece of work in another hospital, what measurement tools did you find most useful? Because obviously there's a lot of them and, and you you know it's good to use them all, but what ones did you find most useful? Um, I think what uh, we found useful at the start um, was uh, to use a fishbone diagram just to have a look at the process that was already um, in place. And then we also use di driver diagrams. So between those two diagrams, we want to look at the process in place and we want to look at where the problems are coming from. And we really, what was really important at all that was the engagement of stakeholders within the hospital, um, that we weren't just assuming, uh, making assumptions. We needed to hear it from the people who were actually doing the work on the ground. Um, in terms of measuring um, our baseline, we found the Pareto chart very useful. Um, so that's where they say, 20% of the 80% of the um, issues come from 20% of the causes. And that's certainly what we found in our baseline audit. Um, as we've progressed, we're using PDSA cycles. Our temptation at the beginning was to undertake quite big audits. And uh, we were almost going down the road of randomized controlled trials and we have to pull that back. So we're now making small changes, looking at those in small numbers and seeing, will we ad adopt the change? adapt the change or we abandon it and try something else. And again, that's very much led by the people on the ground who are doing the work. So the geriatric team that we've been working with, we have an SPO who has specialised in, in uh, GI and then the clinical pharmacists. And um, we've just recently moved on to working with another consultant. And it's great to get different teams feedbacks and see their different processes. 
Right, and and that actually leads in just just to a nice question that's come in from Claire Rowe um, for um, Elaine Audrey and Samira as well. Just you've touched there on the multidisciplinary team that have been involved, but how did you engage clinical staff when everyone is very busy? You have a specific answer for this one now. <laughs> so the first thing we had to say was any involvement in this project will not require any additional time from the people who are going to work with us. And um, it had to be done, as Samira said, within our within our daily resources. Um, we have a lot of uh, uh, discussion liaison with infection prevention control, and um, then there's well established governance here in the hospital through the infection prevention control committee and the drugs and therapeutics around the antibiotic stewardship. So obviously we had the governance, and then in terms of the um, medical teams, we focused on the medical teams first. Just our baseline review of 2022 showed us 20 over 24 cases were in medical patients. Um, then we, Elaine um, went and uh, spoke at the CNM's monthly meeting um, to engage the nursing staff on the floor as well. And the buy-in from them was really good. It's like, you know, it's 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 um, really important to everybody that we protect the patients from C. diff, not just for the patients themselves, but also in terms of our resources, such as isolation rooms, time taken by HCAs looking after those patients with C. diff. Um, so the buy-in has been great. And a great suggestion from our CNM colleagues was to start displaying our safety crosses around the hospital, which is another measurement tool that um, is very visual and very effective and motivating. Okay, okay that's, that's, I think that's really, really helpful. Thank you for that. Um, and Maura, I might just come back to you for a second, because obviously the, the quality day has been a key piece and, and the key piece of your work. Um, this isn't the first quality day that's happened within the service. No, we've, we've run it annually, to be honest with you, and we obviously couldn't during COVID times. But I suppose what it's doing for us here is it's building up a culture. Like, we still have people there. We have people now that are sending up their tomorrow, and they're very nervous. They are so nervous. They don't even want to, and they'll practice the presentation and everything. But I think when you see, and we had a lovely comment for, at a meeting recently, when, when we were gathering and arranging the quality day, and this, you know, anyone was putting a poster, putting a presentation, you submit, we go through and all the rest. And so I said, I'm definitely putting in something this year. I was so embarrassed last year. I had nothing in for my department. And like when you hear that coming back, it's really lovely. Um, but I suppose it, it, it's it's very much about the, the teamwork here. And I, I from point of view, you want to acknowledge that it's actually so lovely to see the range of disciplines mm -hmm. that are actually involved in the quality day. Because really and truly, none of the quality initiatives would actually be sustainable if they weren't embraced by the staff. You know, that's kind of, kind of mm -hmm. the part of it, really. We're looking at support from management from all the disciplines and department because that's actually essential uh, to do it. And then usually we would have one member from our patient representative service user group actually presenting, telling us their story. That we'd have done that with all the years to date. But this year we've just put a little twist in it. So we actually have one of our patient service representatives, she's actually chairing the final session of the prizes. So that's lovely. It was great to have that involvement, you know, from that point of view. Um, I suppose it, it's one thing that I've learned, it's really and truly, it's only together as a team that we here can enhance the learning culture in a psychologically safe space, really, yeah. for all, isn't that it? Yeah. And that will therefore then assist in delivering the safe care to the patients that it's our privilege to care for. Really and truly, and, and together, then we can ensure patient safety here in Tipperary University Hospital. Yeah. Yeah. I think Maria, you touched on something yesterday about the, the we're working within the community, and it's people that are working in the hospital. It's their families that are using the service. Yeah. Could you maybe talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I suppose really, you know, when you look at look at where we're situated in the in 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 the the community. You know, every one of us are local, local to the hospital. We're here because we want to be here. And, you know, it is inevitably our relatives, our patients, our neighbours. They are the people that are that are actually coming, you know, attending the hospital. So, if you know, we work for those. Yeah. We work for the community. We are, you know, we're employed by the HSE. But we are here to serve our community. And I think that's what comes across here, you know, Throughout all the presentations here today, we you know we want to ensure our patients are safe and that culture that you know that fostering that huge culture of improvement and continuous improvement. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. them by yourself as the quality manager and the team around you, really. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's that's where we're you know we've been trying to get. I mean, you know, you can see that the hospital metrics over the years have improved and improved hugely. You know, so I think well done to everybody. Absolutely. Like we have to say tomorrow now we have our uh, taking services that looks after oxygen. So he's going to present. You know, we have people that can't even come into the quality day 
just thinking, oh, do I have it in my pocket? I have, yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> like we have things that didn't make it, like we would say we'd have an end of life committee. So then you would the end of life symbol that would be up on the on the, the doors when somebody's at the, the end of life stage. But inside in, in our kitchens, one of our kitchen staff, Amanda, would just said, Well, look, I'm pushing out my trolley, my trays, and yes, I see the sign and go, Oh my goodness, it, it's out there. But when I'm in the kitchen, I don't. I don't see that. So therefore, so we have PG, who's one of our support services. Well, should come on out. We have a board up there and I'll make them. So he goes and he makes the little magnets and we put it up. So it's it's the full team that's involved in caring for these people. Like we are at the I mean, I know we're at the HSC, but we're really not because when anyone anyone phones in or meets us, we are the face that represents the HSC. Yeah. Like we are the, we might be the only person that they meet either at the other end of the phone or in person. So they, they're relying on us to do our very best. And that's really what we want for, for our patients as well. It's the pride we take yeah. in our work as well. I think that's the huge, huge thing. You know, you've just spoken about Jimmy there in, in, yeah. in Oxygen. I mean, he is so proud yeah. to to manage the whole Oxygen service throughout the whole of the hospital. There isn't a thing he wouldn't be able to answer for you. You know, he works very well with one of the one of the, um, the CNSs in, the, the, in sepsis. He works, you know, they work jointly. Yeah together and that you know there's nobody fearing the other profession everybody works well together that's that's, yeah, yeah, yeah 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 i think that's the, yeah. i think that's the yeah. key the key is the team it's that integration across the whole service within the hospital and nobody's afraid to approach anybody else yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. which is huge i mean if you look at the amount the involvement of staff in it i mean to get 50 staff involved in, in 30 projects or first of them presenting 20, 20 projects i mean it's absolutely phenomenal I and mean, it's it's actually a day of celebration to be honest with you here tomorrow it, it's a there's an uplift in the hospital because people are excited and nervous presenting, but there, there really is such a feeling of goodwill that it, it's it's really it's lovely to see. It makes what you do, going back to your very first question, is this part of our everyday work? It makes what you do worthwhile. You know, you can see it's evident tomorrow it will be evident as it has been throughout these present presentations that is part of our everyday work. This is what we're about. This is our service. And we're proud to deliver yeah. that service yeah. ultimately at the end because of the day. It isn't just a snapshot of four. If you see the, the work from our HCPs and all the others, I mean, DJ, oh yeah, thanks very much. <laughs> that's the range of, of uh, disciplines that's involved. I mean, it's, as you see, it's across the board, it's every discipline, every department, uh, and how we're supported. I mean, it, it is fabulous. So there you are. So we've, it's 15 minute sessions we have turnover, so nobody gets a chance to be bored. <laughs> nobody gets a chance to talk to you long either, for that matter. But I mean, you have a huge range there from uh, inflammatory bowel, you can see their radiology, hearing, um, and it's just, you can see that there's everybody in the hall. It's the yeah. full spectrum of staff and volunteer. And these are, the, like staff haven't even been able to get their presentations up there because we were oversubscribed. And that is, <laughs> it's absolutely oh, yeah. fantastic, yeah. you know, it really is. So I say this is just a snapshot of the work that is going on, and it's 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 audits, it's, it's quality improvements. Like we did um, when we did the national healthcare communication training here in October, we kind of took a blitz for the month of October and did the national healthcare communication training here. And from that, there was a piece came up very much. Well, that's lovely, but what about if you're someone that's that's deaf or they're visually impaired? Mm. So in light of that, which we're actually going to launch tomorrow, we have our new menus done for the the patients and we have say, a large size now there for print for anyone that's difficult like myself that needs that. <laughs> and, and also then from the hearing point of view you see one of our presentations and one of our posters are relying on, on um on the difficulty for somebody if they are deaf coming into our community now we suppose we were very lucky here in COVID times in in some ways insofar as if one of our, our hospital staff actually is deaf so mm. our households that were uh, most of our patients that our own staff, we were very much aware of how important it is and how much she lip read. Yeah. So when we had somebody in and your people were wearing masks and a lot of people on own staff actually lip read. Yeah. So you're looking in the eyes to see if the sign of a smile, the lines, you know, to see the sign of a smile. But from that point of view is we had her expertise as well. And she's well, actually, I need this, I need the visual. There has to be another way of getting this information to me, especially when you're all behind gowns and gloves and masks. And I think, you know, I think to be fair, we've been well supported by the South Southwest Hospital Group. 
because you wouldn't have any of these posts yeah. here without the support from the group, you know. Yeah. So I think, and you know, working with with Celia Cronin yeah. and the in the quality department, and you know, Elaine Elaine Egan has actually now gone to the other side. We haven't left her quite out the door yet, you know. So it's that integration across the whole service. I think that's what's key, really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Look. I we're going to call it there and we'll, we'll we'll pop up a few more just sort of slides just to, to, to share with you some other pieces and resources that you can join in. But you can see from the chat there, I think there's a huge recognition of the quality um, of these particular projects and the impact that they're making within the service. Um, and, and you've heard, I suppose, from the panel in terms of that, that how they've involved the multidisciplinary team and how the patient is at the centre of all of this, um, but also the staff and the recognition that every single staff member within the service add something. They're the professional at what they're doing. They know their service, they know their area, and they all have something to contribute. And um, so just to say thank you so much to our panel. It's uh, It's been a, such a pleasure to work with you all. For people that are interested in, in quality and patient safety and learning a little bit more, there is a broad range of programs available on the QPS prospectus. So you'll see this quality improvement, incident management, open disclosure, um, everything data for decision making. And then there's there's more structured programs um, like the RCPI, RCPI program that's funded by the NQPSD. Um, so you'll see there's a broad range there. The link has gone into the chat box and you can take a look at that. Just to say as well, there's a QPS Ireland network map. So this network map is available for anybody that's interested in quality and patient safety. One of the things you can do is filter by area and by filtering by area, you can see other people working in similar disciplines that you can reach out to and have a conversation with to see what are you doing in your area? We're doing this here and share ideas because I do think a lot of this work. Um, you you learn so much when you have a conversation with others that have done similar work in terms of starting the process a little bit sooner, you know, later things that you can learn along the way that might save you a bit of time. Um, because because we are all in individual different services in some ways, but there's learning that we can take from other areas. So it's worthwhile to, to, to fill in that and, and take time to fill in the network map. You can also join the Q community. Um, and again, the Q community, it's um, an international organization and the NQPSD fund um, funded within Ireland. Again, there's a, a lot of small sub communities. So if you're interested in falls, if you're interested in culture, if you're interested in patient safety in general, there's different breakdown breakout communities that you can join and, and, and access this was the knowledge on that broader QI community. Um, just to say the patient safety together website was launched on the 17th of January. We've mentioned this before. One of the best things I think about this is they have patient safety alerts and patient safety sort of supplements and stories that are accessible um, for anybody that wants to, to, to read it. So you can join that community. The details are there in terms of the email address and the website that you can have a look at there. Um, and we've also launched uh, most recently the quality and patient safety matters. It's a quarterly magazine. Um, we're currently in the production for our July one. Um, but I would ask that you know if you have ideas or thoughts or an article that you'd like to send in, we will be sending out on Twitter a link. And you can scan here if you'd like to, to be able to access the current current magazine. Um, but we will be putting out a link on Twitter for people to send in their ideas for stories, and then we'll come back to you and let you know when we're good to if, if we're good to go and get an article into the the, the autumn edition. Um, our next QPS talk time is on the 30th of May. It's the power of storytelling. Um, in quality and patient safety, and we've talked about the power of stories um, in particular today, and, and the benefit of, of being able to follow that patient story as somebody tra travels through the organisation. This this one will be really good in terms of helping you capture how do you how do you capture a patient story. Um, finally, you can connect with us via Twitter, via our YouTube channel, um, and also on our website. So all of the past QPS talk times are on the website. So finally, final, final slide, there's the link for our survey. You can take time to fill that in if you don't mind. And just to say as well, thanks very much to our IT support here within Tipperary University Hospital um, uh, for supporting us today. And final, final thanks to our panel and to you, the, the participants of the session. Uh, we hope you have a good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.